an imaginary country. And the winner is Arsevi, or maybe Arsevi. There's a lot of pronunciation. <laughs> And Andrew Hudgens' book, Diary of a Poem, that has a lovely picture of him on the cover. Um, it, Joanna Pearson. Parish Church. Hey. And Andrew. <laughs> Don't worry, this is not Gallagher's box. The, um, you know, the comedian. Um, but I have um, some books. And the books are not for sale. The books are free. Oh, you haven't heard the catch yet. The, um, the catch is these books are free to people who have bought this book. The, um, and so I wanted, um, and if I should run out, and I would hope I will, the, um, I'll, I'll take your address and mail you a book. Um, I'm going to do something a little scary. Um, I'm going to read um, um, prose. Um, I'm in a weird situation, or new to me, of having two books coming out next year. One, a book of poems um, called a Clown at Midnight, and one, a book of prose about being a compulsive joke teller. And um, um, it's called, I think, something boring like The Joker. And um, I want to do two things at once. I'm going to read, I'm going to start with the prose and then go to poetry. But I wanted to um, start with a poem. This is a poem. I had a German wire-haired pointer that I love named Rosie. This is a poem called Ball. Nose down, she courses the backyard, searching for her ball, until she sniffs it hidden in tall grass. She pivots on her nose and vectors in on it, from base to apex of a frantic triangle, her brown tail's white tip spinning like a rotor. She finds it, snatches it, and lopes in a long arc back to me. As much as finding it, she loves to hold it in her soft mouth, wriggling with the pleasure of a being a retriever, retrieving pure essence bred to it. When I think of beauty, I think of this dog stretching to full stride, long, loose muscles undulating underneath brown fur until she's running too fast, misjudges, smacks her ball into the neighbor's magnificent azaleas and scrabbles through them, too focused on the zigzag ball to ponder dignity, the sublime, or love, and thus attaining them, the body, fully body, until it drops, exhausted, tongue lolling on brown grass. She stares at me, a light with the exacting genius of her joy. Now, I read that poem, and my wife says to the, said to the dog, um, he's written you a love poem. <laughs> he's never written me a love poem. <laughs> now it's come. <laughs> um, I'm going to read this last a section from this last chapter of um, this prose book. And the working title of the chapter was Death and Aaron. The, um, and um, because those were the two things that the chapter was about. Um, and um, so I've got about a 14 page uh, section from that that I'd like to read you. And then if we have time, we'll do a few poems. I always felt like Jack, the Jack of giant killer fame, who in a lesser known tale Lazy Jack is forced out of the house to find work by his mother. The first day, Jack works for a nearby farmer, but he drops his earnings a penny in the brook on the way home. When his mother discovers this, she shrieks, you stupid boy, you should have put it in your pocket. Next time I'll do that, said Jack. 
The following day, Jack hires out to a cattle farmer who pays him with a jar of milk. Jack dutifully puts the jar in his jacket pocket, and of course, on the way home, he spills it. This time, his mother says, you stupid boy, you should have carried it on your head. The following day, he works for a cheesemaker, wages a block of cream cheese, as he promised his mother, he carries it home on his head, where it melts in his hair and becomes matted. <laughs> mother once more pronounces Jack a stupid boy and tells him he should have carried it in his hands. He promises to do so. The next day, a baker wages a cat. When Jack holds it in his hand, it scratches the daylight out of him, and he runs off. Stupid boy, you should have tied it on a string and dragged it home behind you. Next time I'll do that. The following day, butcher wages a lovely shoulder of mutton. Jack ties it to a piece of string and drags it home with results predictable to everyone but Jack. This time Jack's mother calls him a ninny hammer, a charming disparagement dating to at least 1592, and tells him, he should have carried it on his shoulder. Next time I'll do that, promises our slow study. The next day, Jack goes back to the cattle farmer and at the end of the workday is given a donkey. It's a job to hoist the donkey on his shoulders, but Jack does it and slowly staggers home, bent under the weight of his wages. Jack's path home takes him by the house of a rich man with no wife and only one child a beautiful daughter who is deaf and dumb. We will call her Erin. And while we're at it, <laughs> let's change Jack's name to Andrew. Our folktale Erin has never laughed, and the doctors, being folktale doctors, had prognosticated that she would never speak until someone made her laugh. Now Erin just happened to be looking out her window when Andrew stumbled past, the donkey on his shoulders, the donkey's legs sticking up in the air, kicking wildly. Aaron burst out laughing at the silly man, and laughter being the best medicine, she, remedia she immediately regained her speech and hearing. Her overjoyed father married Aaron to Andrew, who felt richly rewarded for his silliness all the rest of his life. Moral. You're just an idiot with an ass on your shoulder <laughs> until somebody laughs. I first saw my future wife drink a drinking a beer on the porch at Yaddo, the artist colony in Saratoga Springs. A common friend had told me Erin would be there, and she gently nudged us toward each other, though she'd warned me Aaron was a California-style Catholic hand-wringer, one who anguished over the plight of the downtrodden. Sometimes she had a good sense of humor, the friend said, and sometimes she was earnest and touchy, so I should watch my mouth until I figured out whether my uh, particular sense of humor meshed with hers. What I saw Looking at a woman, I was looking at the woman I was to marry, was an open-faced, tall, attractive woman with a jolt of curly hair off her forehead. Unlike the folktale Erin, she looked eager to laugh. In fact, hers was the face of someone who gravitated to laughter, the way other people gravitate toward good looks or the palpably powerful. I decided to go with my instinct rather than our friend's warning which I'll admit were more catnip than red flag. She had a name, Erin McGraw, a name so Irish it might as well be Ireland McIrish. <laughs> and when she told me who she was, I immediately asked if she'd heard about the Irishman who drowned in a vat at the brewery. No, she said. <laughs> They knew he was Irish because before he died, he crawled out twice to take a leak. <laughs> I held my breath for half a second, fearing a pointed rebuff, but she laughed and didn't feel a need to inform me that not all Irish are drunks, thank you very much. Good sign, I thought. I didn't know how good. I soon found out her brother was in AA. <laughs> and her <laughs> 
and her father had been addicted to prescription meds for years. But I dialed back anyway and asked a cutesy riddle. What's Irish and stays out all night? I love this one. Patio furniture. She groaned with a smile and said, but I'm bump tish. T uh, tapping out a ring shot on her thighs. Not much for puns, apparently, but happy to play. After confirming that she is, as her name suggested, was a Roman Catholic, or Catholic, as my Uncle Buddy invariably, derisively pronounced it, I told her about the three Irishmen sitting at a pub opposite a whorehouse in Dublin. Looking out the window, they see the local rabbi walk down the street and after a quick, quick look around, slip into the whorehouse. Ah, and it's a sad to observe the depravity of the Jews, says Patty to Seamus and Murphy, and all three shake their heads knowingly. I love this part of the joke because it lodges in the listener's mind an uneasy anticipation of anti-Semitism. It goes nowhere, but it does raise the tension level. The three Irishmen order a second stout, and as they are drinking, the Presbyterian minister walks down the street and scuttles into the whorehouse. Well, and if that doesn't demonstrate what we've always known about the morals of Protestants, says Murphy to Seamus and Patty, who nod in sage agreement. As they are all relaxing into their third stout, the parish priest, Father Quinn, strolls down the street hesitates a moment, and steps over the threshold into the whorehouse. The three Irishmen say nothing for a moment until Patty says, It's good of the father to visit them, it is. One of the poor misguided girls must have fallen ill. <laughs> and, uh, Sounds about right, Aaron said, laughing. A lot of RCs would resent hearing these jokes from a southerner and a Protestant. Erin, though, has a fond but jeweler's eye for the foibles and venalities of her church and its priests, as well as a wariness of the ex self exculpating sentimentality of the Irish. And this joke indulged both of those misgivings. A joker, but seldom a joke teller, Erin loves to laugh as much as anyone I've ever met. From the beginning, I loved the way our voices joined in laughter, as singers delight in their voices uniting in song. Everyone knows music is sensual, but the free jazz of laughter, soloing and asking for a response, like a clarinet calling to a saxophone, the sax replying with its solo, and the two of them combining in harmony, is sensual and even openly erotic. Aaron seldom finds puns funny, which is a relief. While I enjoy puns myself, I don't like being caught in a barrage of them. She doesn't laugh at racist or violent jokes unless they really catch her off guard. And she laughs briefly before the ugliness catches up with her. Still, she's interested in the forces behind them. She wants to understand the psychology of the racist joke and joke teller because they are alien to her. I wooed her and her peeling musical laughter with the jokes my old girlfriend Jill loved. That dog bites you. And as we got to know each other, you, we might as well leave now, Fanny. And morning, ladies, which to my amazement, she both knew and thought funny. I felt a bit like an adulterer delighting one lover with the pleasures learned from another. Between Jill and me, the jokes were an open intimacy, the hilarity sparked by our delight in each other and flaring in a frantic flame by the romantic disappointments that had brought us together. Each of us then became one of those disappointments to the other. But the things that made us laugh still seemed to me so intimate that I felt irrationally as if I were sharing pillow talk or the details of our sex life if I repeated them. But jokes are not wholly owned by the context and we first enjoy them or enjoy them the most. They have a life of their own. I got over my sentimental attachments 
and discovered that not every joke of Jill's was a hit with Aaron. Sure, she loves and still urges me to ask people, where did George Washington keep his armies? So she can laugh happily when I shoot my hands out my cuffs and crow in his sleeveys. And she laughs, though she knows that every single time I tell it, I think of Jill, who first told it to me. She's not so fond of another one of Jill's, which I sim like simply because it's silly, a pun so dumb it's pure idiot music. Where does the Lone Ranger take his garbage? To the dump, to the dump, to the dump, 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 to the dump, to the dump, dump, dump. Where'd you learn that one, third grade? And what do you have against third grade, Miss Big Shot College Professor? But I had learned a few new ones. After making love one afternoon, I asked her what a man could do in bed to ensure that his woman enjoys a massive, life-affirming, even life-changing orgasm every single time they make love. OK, what? Who cares? <laughs> Delivered with a dismissive shrug. I see Ranger doesn't think that one's funny. The, um, oh, she howled at that one. It's a guy joke, and an ugly joke if one takes the speaker seriously. But most guys telling the joke are, I think, acknowledging while there are guys who think that way. The ones telling the joke are not like them, or else the organi orgasm, the organism, wouldn't be so lovingly described. Some men certainly take no interest in anyone's pleasure but their own. But it's also true there are times when one partner is going to climax and the other, for whatever reason, isn't. And then one either tends to one's own pleasure or is left unsatisfied. Would I have told this joke to my wife before we made love? Probably not. But afterwards, the implicit message <laughs> Quit laughing. The, um, <laughs> but afterwards, the implicit message is different. It says, not only am I not one of those guys, I hope I've shown you I'm not. <laughs> and as Aaron and I age, that nasty punchline takes on a compassionate, even a loving note. If one of us doesn't finish, who cares? The act of love is still love, damn it, if not entirely satisfactory as sex. Aaron and I laugh at most of the same things for most of the same reasons, but with different slants. Her laugh seems to me more compassionate, imbued with a generous Catholic sense that people, by revealing their flawed nature, are somehow reaffirming an ordered universe with God at the top and humans below. To her, the self-satisfying gratification of who cares is in its own small-minded way life-affirming because, as St. Augustine says, to blame the fault of a creature is to praise its essential nature. There is some of that acceptance in my laughter. I wish there were more. But the Calvinism of my childhood makes me expect the worst from people. I see and celebrate the occasionally necessary selfishness behind who cares, but I also deplore it. Aaron disapproves of it too, but finds the lack of hypocrisy charming. Just as she laughs with pleasure when she sees a dog unabashedly being a dog, even if it's protecting its food bowl from a passing shadow, trying to steal another dog's toy, or running to the basement to hide from thunder. But being a joker, carrying a donkey on your back, exacts a toll on one's dignity. When Aaron and I decided we were serious, she called her mother and told her she was seeing a new man. Oh, her mother said, what is he like? Um, uh, well, he's Southern. Aaron knew her father, a lifelong Californian, had gone to medical school at Louisiana State where he joined a fraternity. 
to the last year of his life. He kept his initiation pledge to stand whenever he heard the song Dixie, even if he were alone in his house watching football on TV and the band struck up the tune. He'd love having a Southerner in the family. Oh, Southern, said her mom. Is he courtly? Long pause, <laughs> interspersed with giggling. What's so funny? Are you laughing at me? Her mother was imagining Ashley Wilkes, not a man carrying a donkey on his shoulders. Uh, I don't want to read this next stuff. The, um, that can be skipped. That can be skipped. That can be skipped. Um, um, <laughs> Oh, okay, I should read this stuff, a little bit of this stuff, because um, it touches on some Swanee stuff that you may or may not find funny. Um, I went to, um, a, a long time ago, to a meeting of the Fellowship of Southern Writers, and there uh, was Mr. Lytle, who was one of the editors of the Southern um, the, um, Swanee Review, and um, so was John Sullivan, John, now known as John Jeremiah Sullivan, and I was up in the hospitality speech, uh, sweet, um, making sure the drinkers were being careful. And um, um, okay, a bit overawed by the folks in the hospitality suite, I'd been talking to John Jeremiah Sullivan, then an undergraduate at the University of the South. John, who lived in a downstairs apartment in Andrew Lytle's house, was at the meeting to tend to the elderly writer. But I had failed to get John's name. And when he left the group, I asked someone what his name was. Who? The kid who was just here, I said, Mr. Lytle's boy. From across the circle, a man who'd heard only the last part of the conversation looked up from his guitar and snapped at me. He has a name. It's John. I was abashed. Bourbon and sloppy camaraderie had led me to a patronizing characterization of a young man i just met. A decade later, when I repeated the story to John, he laughed. But I was Mr. Lytle's boy. That night, when I called Aaron, I was still embarrassed by my gaffe. Aaron consoled me. The stranger, she said, perhaps feeling the bourbon himself, had seized a harmless blunder and chastised me in public to make himself look good in front of the famous writers. And so, our most enduring catchphrase was born. At breakfast last week, I asked Aaron, do you want me to clean it? What? That thing there, I said, nodding across the kitchen counter. I'd gone blank. It has a name, she said. <laughs> it's Toaster. Uh -uh. The most loquacious of all our dogs was Buddy, I'm skipping ahead, you can see, whom we met at a cocktail party on the veranda of Rebel's Rest at the Swanee Writers Conference. He stood by the hors d'oeuvre table, discreetly eating a boiled shrimp, <laughs> trying not to attract attention to himself. He had crashed the party. A polite and handsome yellow dog with a fine black muzzle, he didn't beg or lunge at food. He simply stood and waited for shrimp to fall from the plates of the drinkers. Oh, oh I forgot to tell you about this. Um, we'll come back to Buddy. Um, I sent this um, book off to my agent who um, had it for, I don't know, three and a half months, and I sent her an email. Um, How are you doing reading that book? And she wrote back and said she'd been reading it in 40-page chunks, and she'd finished it over the weekend. And I thought, well, I guess she been able to put it down. <laughs> and, um, but she said she'd finish it over the weekend, get back to me. And I'm, on Monday, I get this email that said, I have never read such a well-written book that I have found so repulsive. <laughs> I'm leaving out the repulsive stuff. You have to pay money for that. <laughs> the, uh, well, um, you were afraid I was going to read some of that stuff I told you I was going to read, weren't you, Aaron? I didn't read it. The, um, 
I held out a shrimp to Buddy. He gravely noticed it and then with delicate reverence lifted it from my fingers. He consented to take five more shrimp before I ruffled the thick, thick fold of hair around his neck and went off to fix myself another drink. He strolled back under the table and waited for more food to come his way. I next saw him two days later, nosing with that same odd mixture of gratitude and wariness, a tuna fish salad held by the long fingers of the fiction writer Amy Hempel. This particular sandwich came from the dining hall on the campus of the university, but Amy travels with her, um, her purse and pockets stuffed with dog biscuits and pig ears and plastic baggies. During the course of the conference, she had already placed another stray with someone, and she was quick to notice Aaron's and my interest in the cheerful yellow dog with the black snout. He'd be a great dog for you guys, she assured us. I wasn't convinced that our dominant and cranky German wire-haired pointer bitch would welcome a new housemate with an open heart. Of course he would, she would, said Amy. She'd love to have a companion to play with during the day while we were at work. He seems more obsequious than I'm comfortable with, I said. That's how he's made his living for the last couple of years, sucking up to people for food. He'll adapt to whatever you two want to do. I worried about the green pus oozing out of his penis. That could be something expensive. Oh, that, said Amy, laughing. Don't worry about that. It's completely normal. All my dogs do it. I gaped in admiration at the lie. It was hard to come up with another objection in the face of Amy's determination. Amy could see I was weakening. If I were to adopt the dog, Amy said, she'd pick up half his first vet bill. I'll pay for my own dog, I said stiffly, and then laughed at how deftly she had set the hook. Aaron and I took him to the local vet, and when he picked him up, flea-dipped, neutered, and checked over, Aaron asked if he'd had worms. That dog had every kind of worm there is to have except earthworms, the vet said. <laughs> the next morning, back in Cincinnati, Aaron woke me and said, Buddy's chewed his stitches out, but I think it's okay. I've got the bleeding stopped. <laughs> I got out of bed and went downstairs. The kitchen looked like someone had installed vinyl flooring in an abattoir. <laughs> Get your clothes on. We're going to the vet, I said. Really? I think it's going to be okay. She's the daughter of a doctor and a nurse. Like her parents, she believes that no one needs to go to a hospital unless a substantial length of intestine is actually protruding from the body. And of course, she was worried about stacking up on another enormous vet bill on the visa. So was I. Get your goddamn clothes on. We're going to the vet, I snarled. That's how worried I was. The Tennessee vet had only sewn up the outer layer of dog skin, not the inner one, too, and we actually had been, been within minutes of a length of intestine popping out. After a second surgery, the incision became infected, and for a couple of weeks, Aaron had to hold three times a day a warm washcloth over the dog's incision, and by proximity, over his penis to draw out the pus. The dog mistook her intentions <laughs> and insists that they now share an erotic bond stronger <laughs> than the one between Aaron and me. And frankly, I think the dog's got a point. Though I've asked, I've never been granted that special treatment. <laughs> a talking dog, it turns out, is an, is an invaluable asset to a successful marriage. If I speak harshly to Aaron, either from carelessness or moral failing, Buddy might say loud enough for her to hear, 
Sir, I don't think I'd have used that tone of voice to address the lady, but maybe that's just me. <laughs> or, I'd never use that tone of voice to address you, ma'am, but perhaps it's because I'm better than the sir. <laughs> or he might just whisper to me, Ixne on the anger pay, etard ray. <laughs> Lately, he's been into pig Latin. And the sweet part is that Aaron immediately takes my side. Buddy, we don't use that kind of language in this house, and your sir is not a retard. He just made a mistake, that's all. So that's um, my joke, a part of the joke book. The, um, now, um, the, the poetry book has some meditations on humor and laughter. Um, do I have them? Yeah, I'll read the title poem since it makes a transition. A Clown at Midnight, and it comes from a statement of Lon Chaney's, the essence of pure terror, is pure horror, is a clown at midnight. Down these mean streets, a bad joke walks alone, bruised head held low, chin tucked in, a tight, tucked in tight, eyes down, defiant. He laughs, and it turns to a moan. His wife left years ago and his kids all grown, claim they've never heard of him and frown. Down these mean streets, a bad joke walks alone, jiving with fat whores in the combat zone and moving on each time they put him down. Defiant, he laughs, though it turns to a moan, a sense of humor turning on its own sick pivot. He knows you think he's just a clown. Down these mean streets, a bad joke walks alone. He is a clown, but dangerous, fly-blown, stinking of the bitterest cologne. Defiant, he laughs, and it turns to a moan. He doesn't want to break, rub your funny bone. He wants to break it, break it, then slip, t skip town. Down these mean streets, a bad joke walks alone. But defiant, he laughs, and it turns to a moan. This one's called The Offices. Whether we have slept through Maton's dream offices or lain awake, we rise to a morning bell. We do not call it lauds, and not calling it ablution, we for the day's offices flush dust and dead skin from our many creases. On the highway and at computers pinging all day with the needs and even dreams of those to whom we minister, we labor at gratitude through long and exhausting offices. We do not call terses sects and nuns. At vespers, we share with our bodies a meal not exactly a Eucharist. And before the compline bells imagined ringing, we indulge in bourbon, sex, or prayer and then lie down, thankful for tomorrow's impossible offices, apostles prospering somehow under the Lord's preposterous offices, auspices. I didn't really know how to time this reading prose. Um, if you're a poet, reading prose is strange. You have to get up and wash your hands <laughs> more often. Yes, my wife is my wife does it for a living. Sad. Let me read three and we'll call it an evening. How does that sound? Um, um, I'll read one. And these you may think if you were here last year, you may think you've heard these. You didn't. They're all very different. And I wanted to give a shout out to Adam Vines, who um, read over this manuscript and was very helpful and um smart. Um, one of the things that I'd done, I wouldn't normally talk to people about this, but this is a writer's conference. And one of the things I did, um, I don't know, starting several years ago, was I went through all my notebook and I looked at all those ideas for long projects that had sat there in that notebook for 20, 30 years. And you thought, 
these are never going to be those long projects, are they? So I pulled them out and said, well, what happens if I, I think I made up an arbitrary number like 11. What if I took these ideas and tried to make them 11 lines long just to see what would happen? And, um, and what happened is a few things worked, actually. But what happened was what, if I would thought about it a little longer, I would have known would have happened, which is that the poems grew wider. <laughs> the, um, and, um, and it wasn't until um, and Adam said, well, these seem too long, and in, in, in too long horizontally. I thought, well, that's right, isn't it? So I went back and um, made them a shorter, more um, reasonable length. Um, this is a poem called Welder's Smoke that I read last year, and I wasn't happy with the ending. And I asked people for suggestions. And um, um, most people said, you know, they did what workshops do. They don't help you, they just say, you, you're right, you did it wrong. <laughs> um, and um, you go, I pretty much knew that, but thanks for ratifying it. And, um, and then you have to go back and, um, you know, fix it yourself. Welder smoke. When the light stunned dough went stupid, I couldn't fire. A furtive scruple that meant nothing to the blue light that whooped on behind us us with two whisk pistols sliding across the seat. Bobby, Bobby slapped the lights off and gunned it, slamming into the dark. Pray now, we slewed through switchback roller coaster curves and powered down dust wallows the law didn't know. And until, breathless among scraped pine, sassafras, and kudzu, we watched blue lights split the dark and the dark heal three times as the spit in our mouths dried to welder's smoke. If we were busted, the acrid taste of our, our futures. Around dry mouths, we rolled the metallic residue of iron, copper, and zinc fumes, struggling to love it. The blue lights departed on moonlit kudzu, we spat, but not bitterly, the toxic oxides of a harder world, thinking once spared the effort, I could have loved that life. And then uh, another one that's been revised thanks to Adam's help. I saw my shadow walking. I saw my shadow walking south on Market Street at dawn. He had a long gun in his hand, a Winchester, 1901. He held it in the air and waved. I wondered if he'd died. We, he walked down to the children's park and sat down on a slide. I hadn't seen him for two weeks. He'd slipped his medication and stolen from beneath my bed my Winchester, 1901. The cops told him to drop the gun. He squinted at the sun as he swung up and aimed at them, that Winchester, 1901. Grace Pittman opened her front door and bent to fetch the news when she heard two pistol shots resound, as she said in interviews. I looked and saw the shadow drop like a punctured bag of air, Grace Pittman told reporters, who didn't really care. My shadow wasn't dangerous. The point, I guess, is moot. He must have hated me so much, he forced the cops to shoot. I scrubbed his blood off slide and swings, and shadowless in sun, I walked to City Hall and claimed my Winchester, 1901. And I'm going to end with a poem called Fleeing Time. Um, I think this image is perfectly clear, but it's, um, um, it's a little strange. I'll just tell you what it is anyway. Um, if you've ever walked to the grocery store and come back with nothing in a plastic bag but uh, a frozen block of chicken thighs, um, they make kind of a weapon. 
you know, flying around in that bag. And when I got back to this nasty place I was living, um, I'd, know, I'd long known that someone had just tried to crowbar open the uh, mailboxes, but I'd never stood there with what I thought was a weapon. So I stood there with the frozen chicken thighs and tried to hammer this thing straight. The um, fleeing time. Yes, I was sober. <laughs> fleeing time. Swinging a block of frozen chicken thighs in a plastic sack. That's what I think of when I think of my 20s. Quick stepping home under broken lights to the graffitied complex my fucked jobs forced me to. The frozen meat was a weapon. I swung it like a blackjack and banged the stop sign like a gong. With it, I hammered flat my mailbox door curled by a crowbar. I hammered, hammered, hammered. No one, no door opened, no one yelled, Tempest fucking fugitive. And one day I opened an umbrella and saw inside it the large brick house I'd own, a house owned by other owners, a wife who'd been someone else's wife as I had been someone else's husband. And I was smiling a smile, smiled by many happy people. Tempus, Tempus, linger yet a while. Thank you.